Hello everyone, let's talk about Netflix today. They might not have good shows anymore, but they have pretty cool engineering for the mediocre shows that they have. They have a platform called Cosmos for running their services. Let's talk about that. It will tell us how they think of running large scale services. Okay, this is a diagram of a typical microservices. Containers exposes an API and have the business logic written into it. A Cosmos service for Netflix is not just a microservice. It's a package of multiple components along with these microservices. Let's take a look at this diagram. This is a Cosmos service. They have further separated the concerns of a microservice into different components. The first step is they have a API layer. These are microservices which expose the API that other services would call into. And these microservices are scaled according to the API load. So if there is more load on the API, more instances of this microservice would be spawned. Then we have the workflow engine. This is simple. It defines the basic business logic for what to do in what conditions as per the API calls. Then they have added a part for compute intensive jobs like video encoding, for example, they need to do it a lot. For that, they use serverless functions. So one instance of a serverless function would do some part of the job, like encode a part of the video. Another instance of the same serverless function would encode other part of the video or do some other part of the job. Now look at this. All these components are connected via message queues. So the communication between them is asynchronous. Now look at this, the serverless functions would scale according to what is there in the queue. The insight here is not everything in the service should scale in proportion to the load on the API. The API might get a lot of load and the API part or the API microservices might scale very fast. It might happen that at that time, the serverless functions do not need to scale that fast. It can stay where they are. So the scaling for different parts of the service is independent. Also, this can be tuned to each service. For example, uh, in some services, the serverless function might just need to complete tasks quickly and return the result. And that can scale much faster. And in some cases, the functions might take their time and store the results somewhere in some bucket. We do not need to scale that so fast. So obviously this will depend on the kind of work or the kind of compute that these functions are doing. But you can see that you can tune the scaling for the compute intensive jobs for each service. What I can see is they took a microservice and further broke it down into different kind of components for different kind of workloads. In the case of Netflix, it makes sense as sometimes they would need to do very compute intensive work such as encoding videos, preparing subtitles, etc. And sometimes they would need to do some simple CRUD operation. Now, since they have such a wide range of needs, a Cosmos service might not always have all these components. Look at this diagram. This is multiple Cosmos services talking to each other. You will see in the higher level services, the services which are closer to the client, they do not need to do compute intensive work. So they do not have the serverless functions. Instead, their workflow rules would activate APIs in other services, which would then in turn activate other services. And at the end, there might be some compute intensive work done by serverless functions. So it's not necessary that the serverless function would be added into all Cosmos services, even if they are not required. They think about this whole architecture as microservices plus workflows plus serverless. The whole idea is that the API microservices would invoke workflows and they would orchestrate the serverless functions to do the heavy lifting. All right. This diagram is also from Netflix's blog. The particular workflow rules you write, the functions you write or the APIs you write do not need to know about the scale that they are running at. That's the work of the platform. For Cosmos, the API platform is called Optimus. They have a workflow rules engine called Plato and they have a serverless computing platform called Stratum. Now these are scale aware platforms, which would manage the scale, these platforms. And we would write these components on top of that, which are scale agnostic. They do not know what scale they are running at. They just do some work. Let's talk a bit about Plato here. Now Plato is a platform where developers can deploy their workflow rules and these workflows are always on. What does that mean? Let's say they make some change. The workflow would run automatically instead of them having to explicitly trigger it. The example Netflix gives in their blog is as they develop better encoding algorithms, the workflows would automatically update the older videos without them having to re-trigger the workflows for the older videos. Now the workflow rules are written in a custom language called Emirax, which is based on top of Groovy. 
And what they do is they match on certain conditions. They specify what code to execute or what action to take when those conditions are matched. What should be the reaction when that code of action has executed? and what happens if there are error. So it has very simple semantics to do very simple and specific set of tasks. You can see the simple rules can match conditions from the API and create workload for the serverless functions. So at this point, let's talk about the serverless platform straight up. And the things I will talk about here is not just specific to Netflix or their platform. I see the things that they have mentioned here is pretty good to keep in mind when designing any serverless platform. Okay, so the first thing is, how does anything in serverless run? there would be some kind of a control plane which would take in the requests and that would then try to get resources for running the particular function. So maybe it would create a container or get hold of a container somehow and run the function there or execute the function there. It's not necessary that it would always be a container or it would always try to get a container or create a container. It can be other resources of compute as well. You can think of this as a unit of compute. So in, in the case of a serverless function, the latency to serve a request is not just the time taken to process it, but it's the time taken to find the resources plus the time taken to run the function. This is why you might have heard about cold starts in serverless functions, because before running the function, it's trying to get some resources to run the function. The good thing about these kinds of platform is that they can be scaled to zero or they can be scaled to a lot, although they have their cold start problems. This kind of an architecture makes sense for Netflix because sometimes many studios might not be releasing any movies and sometimes a lot of studios can release a lot of movies at once. So they need that dynamic elastic scaling. But how can we reduce this latency? They have given us four tricks that they use. First is using a dedicated resource pool for some services. Important services can have a dedicated resource pool of their own. So on these resources, only functions from that service would run and nothing else would. The next way is having warm capacity. This is a very commonly used pattern in these kinds of architecture where the containers or the resources are kept ready even before the request arrives. So when the requests arrive, these containers are ready to go and you would just run the function there and return the response. But the size of the warm pool is a difficult statistic to land on since if you have a larger than required pool, then you would just be wasting resources on keeping those containers or the resources up. And if you have a smaller pool, then you are uh, giving up on latency. So this might need to be selected carefully. The next thing is micro batches. It says that you don't need to create a new container for every function invocation, but you can reuse the same containers to run more functions. For example, if a function is invoked 10,000 times, it might run one time on 10,000 containers or 10 times on 1000 containers. So you're reducing the number of containers required, but you are running one function more times on the same container. The last is priority, which is simply prioritizing important work. The end users of the Stratum platform can set the priority for their workloads. So when the resources are less, the Stratum platform would run the high priority tasks and the low priority tasks would wait. This would be easier to implement when it's just one company's internal platform, but harder for a generic cloud platform. Since multiple organizations workloads would be running on the platform and anyone can set priority any way they wish to. All right, that's all I wanted to discuss for today. Leave a like and comment what you think about this architecture. If you have any questions, subscribe for more engineering videos and make sure to read the blog from Netflix linked in the descriptions. You will learn a lot. See you in the next one.